We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Hello, good afternoon. It's great to welcome you in this uh, session uh, of the International Governance Forum. Uh, we will be talking about ensuring diversity in the artificial intelligence world. And I'm very pleased to be joined by um, three fantastic speakers. We have with us uh, Sumaya Al Alhiri, Head of the Governance and Data Department at the UAE Ministry of Artificial Intelligence. We have Alice Xiang, and great to have you, Sumaya. We have Alice Xiang, Head of the Ethics for Sony Group. Welcome, uh, Alice. And we have uh, uh, my dear Constanza Gomez Mont, who is founder and CEO of C Minds. And she was also uh, a member of the expert group that drafted the recommendation on ethics of artificial intelligence. My name is Gabriela Ramos. I am the Assistant Director General for Social and Human Sciences here at UNESCO. And this is the sector that uh, oversaw the um, development and supported member countries in their negotiations of the recommendations on ethics of artificial intelligence. And um, we are proud and we come to this uh, uh, forum with the great news that 193 countries in the last general conference of UNESCO approved the recommendation uh, with standing ovation. And therefore this is the first ever uh, global instrument on the, on the ethics of AI, which is related to the things that we are going to be discussing today, because the fact is that ethics is about inclusion, ethics is about justice, eth ethics is about respect, is about diversity. And this is something that we are going to be uh, discussing in this session. Unfor unfortunately, Minister Balgobin is not able to join us this evening because he just got trapped in uh, some other things. We will have some time for questions and answers at the end. And I would, I would encourage you to just uh, raise your hand and so we can give you the floor uh, to do a very uh, concrete questions. You can follow up the discussions and tag your comments with the slash IGF 2021 slash day zero uh, minus 26 and a slash diversity and AI. And the, and the discussion today is quite uh, relevant because of several reasons. First, because if we look at the, at the business model um, that big uh, tech uh, and uh, digital companies have now um, developed uh, is highly concentrated. We know that uh, five countries uh, in the world and 200 firms are producing the majority of the developments in the AI system. Um, and, and the rest of the world either are users or are just not connected because we still have half of the world that is not connected. In terms of diversity, uh, cultural diversity, we also know that the majority of the developments are produced in one single language. And language is culture and language is history and language is mindset. And therefore, uh, much of what is produced is being uh, produced with those uh, lenses. Um, we know also that uh, only 22% of the, of the um, personnel, of the staff uh, working in the developments of AI uh, are women. And, and therefore, diversity from the gender perspective is neither um, high uh, in these uh, technologies. Uh, and therefore, what I would like to uh, advance in the conversation today first is to get our figures right and hear from our speakers, how do they uh, perceive this issue? Uh, but also, we, I would also like to advance how much of the downsides that we know the technologies bring with them uh, is also linked to, the, to link to this lack of diversity. How much of the biases or the stereotypes or the uh, outcomes that sometimes the, the AI technologies provide with 
are linked to this uh, issue of not being very representative, either in the data sets or in the, in the way we advance the algorithms or train the data and, and on the way we apply the conclusions of AI. And this is not a minor issue because we know that, uh, yes, certainly AI can help us to, to make day-to-day -day decisions, but they can also support uh, governments to take major issues related to health, related to education, related to finance. And day by day also, the big platforms are uh, doing or taking a lot of decisions regarding uh, these technologies. So diversity for us, for UNESCO is key, is really uh, core to the, to the definition of what needs to be done in the, in the, in the ethical world and, and the way we advance it in the recommendation. But it's also because we know that it produces more sustainable outcomes. Just a very short comment on the on the recommendation. Uh, Constance is here with us. She was working with us as the expert group, as part of the 24 expert groups that, that the Director General Azulei put together to uh, draft the recommendation. Um, the, the ethics was defined as a set of values that bring us together as humans, but also related to the promotion and defense of human rights and human dignity to the question of fairness, to the question of inclusion, to the question of living in, in harmony. Uh, but then these uh, values and, and the human rights perspective was translated into concrete principles of transparency, on explainability, on, on uh, redressal, on the rule of law, and then in very concrete policy chapters. So this is a very actionable instrument uh, because it goes into the depth of education, communication, gender, very strong chapter on gender, environment, and all to say, how do we ensure that the technologies support us as humans in the, in the delivery of solutions for the challenges we face and how much we can also avoid that they become part of the problem instead of part of the solutions. We will be working, implementing with our member states. Uh, we're gonna develop an ethical impact assessment linked to the recommendation and also a readiness assessment to take care to take into account the very different uh, levels of developments uh, that countries are experiencing in this in this domain. So, without further ado, I would really uh, like to chip in with our with our speakers and ask them to. Um, do some opening remarks, no more than five minutes each, with the with the very concrete questions on how to increase diversity in the digital world, and what measures would you recommend derived from your own experience and from you and where you come from. I will start with uh, with Sumaya Al Ahri, uh, as I said, the head of the governance and data department of the UAE Ministry for Artificial Intelligence. Sumasa, Sumatra, you have Sumaya, you have the floor. Thank you, thank you, Ms. Gabrielle, and uh, it's a pleasure to be in this panel with the team speakers. It's it's a great honor. Um, so internally, we are in the process of developing a federal um, uh, federal level AI ethics principles. And uh, during the benchmarking uh, phase, which is a um, a phase of of doing um, a horizon scanning and and some sort of um, a small study just to identify what are the best practices. We have analyzed over 50 official documents and reports uh, from different countries and organizations, and they were so diverse. The, the terminology were different, but the concept in most cases were the same. And, and then came the UNESCO AI ethics principles uh, as the first international text that we hope will unify the definitions and, and, and AI ethics principles across different nations. And hopefully one day we reach an interoperable um, uh, we reach interoperability and in, in, in standards um, uh, and the level of a common language in the field of AI. And um, to, to talk about the, the um, to answer your question, it's uh, Gabriela about the UNESCO, of uh, the AI ethics principles were resonating to the uh, approach we followed in the development of the UAE data privacy law, uh, which was issued recently and announced just a couple of weeks ago. So the principles uh, promote mainly a multi-stakeholder approach in developing data protection framework, taking into consideration best international practices in the process of collection and processing of personal data, such as and notably obtaining informed consent. Um, and in the UAE, we know the different perspective that technology regulation is often seen as a burden to technology development 
However, uh, we were very keen on, on adopting an innovative and flexible data legislation that enable technology invention, innovation, and diffusion. Uh, the process of engagement in a strategic conversation with different stakeholders in the UAE was a key success factor to, to identify issues, discuss solutions, and intervene at a minimum to balance the individual rights and achieve digital economy prosperity. And, and this conversation is continuous as well. And um, another principle that, that um, uh, is the promotion and the facilitation, uh, the, the use of quality data sets, and, and, and that's for training and development of AI system. The AI ethics principles also balance the grant of a full ownership to data subject with the exception in certain circumstances. And this was mentioned in the AI ethics in paragraph 73. Those circumstances should be legitimate, such as the enforcement of an existing contract uh, for the protection of public interest or the interest of the data subject. Um, therefore, so glad to see such a flexibility as well in the text. And uh, on the topic of bias in AI, um, it is a topic of great importance. AI bias in most, if not all cases, also are unintentional. And this is where the, the focus is. It is a very weak policy problem and even big tech companies that has all the necessary resources and knowledge fail to avoid bias in relatively simple data classification cases. Um, therefore, in the UAE Smart Dubai AI ethics principles uh, that was issued a few years back, provide a guidance that AI decision has to be validated by a human, especially those with high risk. Also, we are looking into the principle of system maintainability which has been mentioned in Myriad's AI ethics principle, which is made regularly. Uh, the maintainability is, is a process, a very regular process for any AI system to avoid a snowball effect of biases, especially in unsupervised machine learning and AI technology. I, I hope this answered your question. This, this answer, my question, uh, Sumayan actually make us very proud because the fact is that the as, uh, as one of the members that was uh, very strongly supporting the recommendation, the UAE now is really into the, the, the ground of how to make it count. And all of the elements of what you, what you mentioned uh, is, is what the recommendation applies, the, the whole AI life cycle, starting with the research and the development and the implementation, and the, uh, but at the end is human determination. And, and the fact is that we need to be aware of these uh, uh, limits uh, to, to advance uh, more diversity. Let me give the floor now to Alice Yang uh, that can bring the perspective of the, of the private sector on, on how to advance diversity. How, what, what does Sony Group does to do that? Uh, maybe you are part of that, the, of that uh, drive uh, and can share some of the insights. So Great, please, uh, Alice. Yes, thank you so much, Gabriella, and um, thank you so much for the invitation to be on today's panel. It's truly an honor and pleasure to join the rest of the panelists today. Um, so Sony was actually one of the first um, companies in the Asia Pacific region to come out with AI ethics guidelines um, back in 2018. And um, diversity is actually one of the key values um, among our AI ethics guidelines. And so for my opening remarks, I wanted to speak a little bit in terms of why diversity in AI is so important in particular. And so when people think about AI, oftentimes they think of AI as simply being code, um, maybe data as well. But what makes AI unique and different from many deterministic technologies is that AI learns from examples and is based on the objectives that are set out by its developers. And so in order to develop AI that works well for all people in a global market, it is thus very important to think about diversity at the heart of AI development. And so the data that AI learns from as vignettes of the real world should be diverse. If a computer vision model, for example, is only trained on faces of Caucasian individuals, it will likely struggle to accurately identify and recognize um, individuals from non-Caucasian groups. And cases of misrecognition can lead to substantial harms given the proliferation 
of AI into higher stakes domains, such as healthcare, education, finance, and employment. And in addition, when it comes to setting these objectives for AI, it's important to consider diversity and fairness. So how can we ensure that the model is optimized to work not only for those who are in the majority of the training data set, but for all relevant individuals? And in addition to how diversity can affect the performance of the model itself, it's also to, important to consider the fact that AI products are increasingly global in their reach. And so in order to address AI regulation and AI ethics on a global level, we need to consider how values and cultural contexts can differ by country. So AI ethics, of course, is the intersection of AI and society. So without an understanding of the societal context where the AI is being developed or deployed, it's extremely difficult to adequately address relevant societal harms. So for example, law enforcement use of AI is extremely controversial in the United States because of its history of biased policing practices. And so AI developers who study AI ethics tend to be quite well acquainted to the failure modes of trying to develop AI for the US law enforcement context. Of course, every country, though, has its own unique societal inequities and its own failure modes that can be exacerbated by AI. So when we see cases like misinformation and polarization in Myanmar contributing to attacks on minority groups, um, this reflects the ways in which AI can intersect with unique societal tensions in specific regions and create very harmful results. So counteracting such results, some such harmful results requires a greater awareness and understanding of the context in which AI is deployed. And so finally, I wanted to talk a little bit of going from diversity in terms of the countries where AI is actually being developed and deployed into diversity um, at the level of companies that are developing AI. And here it's very important to consider how company culture can foster or hamper diverse AI teams. So AI um, is a very male dominated field and it's also a field that's primarily comprised of individuals from Europe or Asia um, in terms of ancestry. And so it's very important for companies to think about how to include um, a wider variety of perspectives in their AI development. Oftentimes companies um, blame diversity issues on pipeline issues in terms of number of available candidates with relevant backgrounds. But the reality is that such pipeline issues fail to account for higher rates of attrition among women and minorities um, in tech positions. And such attrition is due to the fact that um, oftentimes AI team cultures are not necessarily inclusive and can be toxic to both women and minorities. And so when we are thinking about addressing AI diversity, it's thus very important for us both to take a macro and a micro view. AI is increasingly important for the global economy and having wide ranging societal impacts. And so in order to build a future of more just and equitable AI, it's important to have diversity at the heart of our AI development. Thank you so much, and it's and it's telling Alice that you that you were speaking on on, on behalf of, of Sony, but you you feel that Sony is a, a well representative of this drive to ensure diversity. Um, yes, yeah, so I think that as I mentioned, that's basically um, one of our very key tenants um, and pushes in our AI ethics principles and in terms of the work that we're doing, and so. Um, I think that's critical for every single company that's entering the space to think carefully about the role that diversity plays as they're building out their AI teams, as they're building out the technologies that they're developing. And, and Sony is super strong in the development uh, of AI, one of the major contributing contributors uh, in the world. Uh, Constanza, what, what's your take coming from the other side of the world? And actually, uh, in this multi-stakeholder approach that we are always promoting, uh, representing, can we say, the voice of the civil society? 
Well, um, a perspective from civil society indeed, and actually today from Brazil. So also with the perspective of the global South in, in various ways. Um, so as we heard, the digital world has a profound and longstanding diversity and inclusion challenge. Um, when we talk about, for example, that only 8% of women are CEOs of top 500 companies around the world, or actually the data you, sh uh, you showed, um, Gabriela, of 22% of women participating in the AI sector, we're not only talking about superficial facts, actually we're talking about root causes of various important issues for fairness, justice, and all actually all fundamental rights that we touch in the recommendation. And to mind this diversity gap in the digital world, we have to address diversity in the workplace for sure, as the other speakers, Sumaya and Alice have said, um, ensuring both the appropriate hiring processes and retention processes, of course. And also some of the foundations to access diversity of talent um, that are spread in different geographies have been actually strengthened during the pandemic. Now we have seen that companies have gone digitally and now they're starting to hire people from different geographical concentrations of talent. And thus more opportunities for people that live all over and not only in the tech clusters can access this workforce. Um, this sometimes becomes an important factor actually for many underrepresented communities which have local networks and social support systems in their hometowns. However, we have to go beyond um, addressing diversity in the workplace and expecting that this is like a checklist that if we have just diversity, we accomplish inclusion and we have equal opportunities. And actually to this end, um, I, I believe that all of the speakers here today, um, we recognize that diversity and inclusion are not the same thing. Um, diversity is about representation and indeed it is a very, very important step. And inclusion is about respecting and giving value to the diverse perspectives on the participations and the contributions of different groups, which is equally important. Um, for this, enabling education programs, for example, for managers and people from all levels on implicit bias, and not only understanding cultural differences, but also celebrating them as a part of the DNA of institution becomes key when we talk about diversity and inclusion. And to talk about diversity and inclusion of the digital world, um, leading to more opportunities and social equality, we must also broaden um, the discussions and the narratives with a broader lens to look about the barriers beyond the workforce realm. Actually pushing for more and better ways to enable more prepared talent, for example, from underrepresented groups, the need for greater investment, for example, for access and education for reskilling programs tailored for uh, communities with a strong focus on you, the youth sector, for example. And tech skills have to be complemented, of course, with other skills, such as, for example, negotiation. When we see that not only the tech skills are what make, it makes or breaks the participation of underrepresented communities in the tech sector, but also core skills such as negotiation, for example, that has led to huge impacts in, for example, the salary you have when entering a company. And moreover, it is not only about addressing how to have more diversity and inclusion in the development of the digital tools through the tech sector, but also the need for more diversity and greater inclusion of the accessibility of these tools. Actually, when we talk about accessibility and democratizing access for many communities all over the world to be able to participate in this digital economy and be able to benefit from um, these, these tools makes a huge difference when we're talking about a broader social justice and broader social equity. For example, I'm right now in Brazil when um, a, I learned about a case study in, in one of the poorest neighborhoods in, in Brazil where an organization called Recode actually taught a lot of students how to use VR video and how to use digital tools to be able to narrate their stories of their communities. And with these skill sets, they, they made a video about one of the most uh, remote areas and communities of Brazil. And they showcased broadly how this community did not have access, for example, to roads. And using these digital tools, these students from a, a far community in Brazil got the attention of both civil society, the government and everyone enabling a greater conversation on what to do with this. Well, story short, this led to the creation of more, more roads for these communities, which then led to the access of agricultural and selling their products in the market, et cetera. So as we can see, it is not only about the diversity and the development of the tools, but also a key diversity in the access of underrepresented communities 
to these tools for a social broader aspect. And with this, we can talk more about, for example, Garabella, you said about language. Um, I believe there's only 350 um, of some 6,000 languages in the world that are represented online. So when we're talking about inclusivity and we're talking about the cultural representation of this digital economy, we must embrace the fact that this is a very diverse world and we must have um, better and better tools to address this, this challenge. There's tons of examples that we can talk about um, this, this specific language barrier, some of them proudly from Mexico, from the country I am from, and Gabriela, I know you too, of where, for example, indigenous groups are helping communities or, or youth are helping indigenous groups be able to translate their language into diverse, um, different applications. So in general, um, when, when, when I see this topic about diversity and inclusion, I like to think about it not only how are we gonna promote it in the development of the tools that that takes us to the tech sector and diversity and gender participation and data quality and representation world, but also in a, bigger, in a broader lens, how can these tools help create broader inclusion in all aspects of society? I think you're in mute. I think I think that's the that's the that's the right framing, and this is something also that Alice was mentioning with the micro and macro, because one thing is to uh, look into the very concrete technological issues related to how diverse are the algorithms or the no how unbiased on, or how diverse is the data sets and how much we can ensure that you have uh, more representativeness. The other point is, uh, and I think that's probably more important is how do we ensure that the digital transformation contributes to close the gaps that we have in the regional, in the, in the, in the analog or real world. Uh, and this is exactly what UNESCO is uh, uh, main message with the recommendation is not about just uh, fixing the technology, but ensuring that the technology contributes to these broader goals and not exacerbate them. But I want to take on, on one of the issues you were talking about, 350 language, and, and, and we have thousands, no? And, uh, and as I said at the beginning, uh, we have still half of the world not connected to internet. So, so it's, it's really a, quite an effort that we will need to do to ensure that the, that the, that the richness of the world, the cultural richness, the ge geographical richness, the language rich richness, is translated into these uh, marvelous technologies, and so maybe uh, we can ask uh, Sumaya, coming from the from the Arab world, uh, and we know how rich has been the the Arabic in in so many ways uh, in terms of culture, in, in terms of civilization, but also in terms of language. Uh, but we know that uh, is not uh, commensurate the 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 role and the and the uh, prominence of the Arab language in the developments in the AI world. And there is uh, many instances in which we have seen that the, the developments are not as good as uh, working with Arabic than uh, they are as working with some other languages. So could you, could you um, help us? Because this is something that I'm sure you have been thinking about. Here at UNESCO, we also work in the promotion of, um, of languages. Uh, and also of dialects, uh, promotion of culture in, in all its uh, intense dimensity. So, um, Tumaya. Thank you, Gabriela. This is a very interesting question, actually, um, as, as part of our strategic mandate here in the AI office, and it's um, stated in the AI UAE strategy, um, is, is to build a wider knowledge production in the UAE. And one of our researchers here in the UAE, and he's actually a member of the AI expert group. Um, he has recently published a very interesting article uh, addressing the challenges in developing AI uh, for the Arabic speech recognition. Um, the, the general challenges uh, for those who are not familiar with the Arabic language, uh, there, there is one only one classical Arabic language, which is often used in formal writings and occasionally in public speaking. But also there are 22 Arab countries in the Middle East speaking in different dialects. And in some of these countries, there are more than one dialect or accent and, and, some, and sometimes different vocabulary even. So mainly that is the main challenge. So despite the fact there exists more than 
450 million Arab speakers in the globe, but the AI systems was not the AI system was not able to cope to all the differences uh, within the Arabic language. Um, speaking of the other general issues in the Arabic language that makes it hard for the AI uh, is, is the exclusion of most vowels in the words. Uh, and, and another one is the Arabic grammar is, is more complex than any other language, as far as I know, uh, in addition to the morphological richness, uh, which is even more complex in the formal Arabic language. Um, the, the other issue is the similarity of words used. So you see the exact same words in different sentences, but the meaning differs based on the context. And then another issue is the diacritic signs uh, has an important role in changing the meaning. It is rarely used now in, in the Arabic text. Um, so it's easy for an Arab to identify the words without diacritic signs, but I can imagine how difficult it is for an AI system. And, and finally, um, all of that contributed to the lack of the Arabic context, content, and that's mainly um, connectivity could be one of the reasons, as you mentioned, Gabriella, and, and the data for training the AI system as a consequences. Um, for the formal language and the different accents and dialects, um, that's even harder. So you see mainly most of the internet content um, in Arabic language, it's mainly the formal Arabic, not the different accents and the, and the dialects. Um, so that really limits the research community in this field. And, and what what to do about it, Sumaya? Because you're also, I mean, I know that uh, that the UAE is is making a lot of investments um, to really um, incentivize the more developments and more representation and more um, uh, technologies that could be developed by by the region. Um, do you have plans for that? Is is there something that you should you would like to share with our audience? Uh, on how uh, the UAE is contributing to this diversity in language, because it's mind-boggling, no? We're, we're talking about uh, Arabic and you're telling us, yes, but there's not a single one. <laughs> there are many and we, we need to capture these nuances too. Sure, it's, it's mainly a collaborative approach and, and, and this is what the UAE is doing currently. We're starting simply with the academic institutes here in the UAE. We're supporting any research that takes place in this era. In, in this field as well. Um, the AI expert group has a number of researchers who's been conducting research on this topic and we're being uh, like communicating with them to see what are the recent updates and supporting them in cases they would like to, um, um, to have any sort of support to reach out uh, or, or probably data gathering. And this is what we have been doing with the academic institute. So all started there. And, and the, other, the other initiative that we've been working hard and, and, and probably you have recently heard of is the attraction of talent and mainly talent in the field of uh, coding and that's part of the national coding program so the the, the more talent you attract uh, probably will have more talent so the more diverse uh, it is the, the ecosystem would be and in this case hopefully this will solve part of the problem as well very very interesting we will we will follow up with you because this uh, could be a, quite a contribution to the work that we need to do to implement uh, the unesco recommendation uh let me then turn to to alice because um, in this very um clear uh, stakeholder approach uh major sources of innovation comes from the private sector and we have been in a world in where some of the major developers or the or the countries that have the the leadership in these in this, uh, technologies have uh, preferred a light touch kind of regulation to, to uh, move the market forward uh, and actually focusing mostly on, on commercial gain and to maximize uh, uh, economic performance of the, of the business sector. Uh, the recommendation that we have just approved, Alice, in, in, the, in, the, in UNESCO with the support of uh, also with, of the Korean government uh, is calling for not more, not less, but more effective regulatory frameworks, uh, because we believe that uh, the downsides that we are confronted with these technologies in this almost no-free um, uh, uh, experimental work world 
is is causing a lot of damage. How would you how would you um, see that from the from the pi private sector perspective? How would you engage uh, with this uh, new wave of uh, because the tide is turning, and um, and how do we ensure that businesses are also coming forward to join us uh, to to become more concerned about uh, inclusiveness and diversity in the world? But at the same time, of course, you need to to have uh, good numbers uh, for the business. So. The floor is yours. Great. Yeah, thank you so much, Gabriela. I think that's a really important question. And um, from my perspective, I think it's quite important to have collaboration between practitioners, policymakers, regulators, civil society in this space in order to determine the specifics of AI regulations. And I think increasingly companies do have a lot of their own internal apparatus as well to try to address some of these harms. So in fact, um, for example, in my role as the head of AI ethics for Sony, um, my teams are responsible in part for conducting AI ethics assessments internally and trying to get ahead of issues before they become a problem by identifying potential harms at the stage of um, even planning for AI technologies. So before a single line of code has been written, we conduct assessments to try to ensure that the types of products that people are proposing are in line with our AI ethics principles. Um, and I would say that even though companies are sort of doing this one by one, of course, regulation is a very important aspect of this picture as well to create um, more conformity across the board. Um, that said, I think the challenge of regulation in the AI ethics space is that there are not necessarily yet clearly defined best practices across industry that can simply become the basis for regulation. So this is both a very broad space and also a very new space. So by and large, um, companies have very diverse practices at the moment, and um, there's not necessarily a clear sense of what is the best um, practice. And indeed, even when we get to very basic questions in this space, like how do you define fairness or unfairness in the context of AI, we see extensive um, debate on these fundamental questions. Um, and in addition to that, I think it's also important to recognize that the nature of ethics in general, and in particular AI ethics, um, is that there are no 100% correct answers. And indeed, sometimes ethical principles or guidelines are actually in tension with each other. So for example, um, should your goal be from a fairness perspective for your AI product to work well for as many people as possible in the place of deployment, or for your AI product to work equally well for all people, regardless of their demographics? And in this case, you might think, okay, of course we want both of these things, um, but in practice, it can actually be quite difficult from a technical perspective to optimize for both. Um, and in another example, transparency and security are sometimes in tension. So for example, the more you reveal about your data, how your model was developed, how it arrived at specific decisions, the more possibility there is of security breaches from hackers who now have a better understanding of your system and its potential weaknesses. And so when we think about policies or regulations in this space, it's very important to try to strike the right balance where ideally you're incentivizing all of these relevant principles, um, but in practice it can be quite a tricky line drawing exercise, especially in these areas on the margins where there can be some tension between multiple ethical desiderata. Um, and then going kind of to the point about how do we think about policy and regulation on a global level. So I think this is a really important question given the global nature of AI. And in fact, this is a challenge we're seeing already even in just the data privacy space. So not even thinking about AI regulation in particular. But um, with data privacy, every country has its own laws and sometimes these laws can have quite different definitions, quite different rights in place. And this can create a lot of tensions when you're trying to build AI products for a global market. 
So for example, let's just start with the very basic case where you are trying to collect a diverse data set because you're concerned about bias in your models. And so in this case, you need to consult privacy lawyers from around the world in order to ensure that your data collection practices are actually in compliance. And it's not as simple as simply saying, well, as long as you comply with privacy laws in a few regions that have particularly stringent laws, you'll be okay across the globe. Um, in practice, there are a lot of very small nuances that can make that quite difficult. So even something as basic as just wanting to actually ensure that people are represented in your data often comes with all of these additional challenges just from a global conformity perspective. Um, and so from that standpoint, I think as we think about developing further regulations in the AI space, it is quite important to have this sort of international discourse because to the extent regulations um, have some conformity across different regions, that can be very helpful for ensuring that regions are included in AI development and that AI products can have more of a global reach. And, and 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 let me ask you because because uh, yes it's it's um you're making very good points in the sense that uh, for somebody outside the industry it might be like well but it's very simple you need to be inclusive but sometimes or or you be to you need to be transparent and you need to share and be explainable and all of these principles that we have in the in the AI world but then you have those other downsides in terms of the vulnerability or the risks or even the fact that you have some business operations that might uh, be competing with some other outcomes. But the fact is that globally, what I see is that there is growing concern of, of uh, the lack of accountability in some places, not all, but in some that some developments have caused harm. And, and for example, the recommendation of UNESCO uh, calls for explainability, of course, but we are also uh, recognizing that there are multiple objectives and that this is not a straightforward issues. But the fact is that I feel that the, that the governments are increasing their stance to be more um, directive in terms of uh, regulation. And we are seeing that that's happening in the EU with the uh, directives that are being negotiated. Uh, the U.S. has several cases in the in the procurement and the in the prosecution uh, list, and also they have launched this bill of rights. Where where is where is uh, Asia? Uh, and I know Asia is too big, but uh, where is Korea? Where is uh, where are the main the main players there? Uh, because the fact is that if you go for national regulations on, also, then for the companies this is very heavy. Um, compliance becomes very heavy, and we we prefer to have like common rules general, and then have operations that are not so uh, complex, no? Yeah, certainly. Um, I would say so um, from the Sony perspective, so um, even though we are um, based, um, headquartered in Asia, we take a very global perspective on this, especially given many of the regulatory movements in the US and EU. So for example, we have, um, um, issued comments on the proposed EU um, regulations. And um, I would say that um, for many companies, um, the, general, um, the general perspective towards these regulatory movements is not so much that people don't want any regulation. In fact, I think many companies would be quite in favor of having clear regulation that um, provides clear, um, clear rules in terms of what the acceptable versus unacceptable use cases are, what is needed for compliance. Um, so from that perspective, I don't think it's necessarily always a tension between industry and folks who are pushing for more regulation. Um, that said, it is very difficult to get to the level of detail such that implementation is more straightforward. And I would say, Typically, from an industry perspective, a lot of the push is for more clarity because it's we can all agree upon the very broad principles, fairness, explainability, privacy, security, um, trust, safety, so on and so forth. But it's quite challenging once you get to the implementation stage. And I think um, what would be the worst case probably is if we have um, regulations that are quite strict, but don't actually provide much clarity. And so folks are very much operating in the dark in terms of what is appropriate versus inappropriate. 
Um, and I think that's especially challenging if, if you are, for example, a smaller company that doesn't have um, as much resourcing around compliance. Um, and of course, that's not the case for Sony. And so we're quite involved um, with many of these policy discussions, um, but it's something to consider in terms of the broader AI ecosystem, how to ensure that it's not only um, favoring larger companies that can invest in this area, but it provides clear enough guidance for all companies in the space. And, and we will be calling on you, my dear, <laughs> because we will be looking for the ethical impact assessment and we're gonna have a multi-stakeholder approach as it was on the construction of the recommendation. Uh, but let, then let me t t t turn to Constanza because we have talked language, we have talked uh, business uh, uh, positioning, we have, uh, and, and at the end, what I'm getting from the panel is that there is this uh, consciousness about the need to deliver uh, for good, um, the need to enhance the contributions of the technologies for positive outcomes and then to control the downsides. Uh, but Constanza, you were key, and I know because you and I work together, uh, to see how much the gender um, lenses were really introduced as a, as, a, as a particular element in the recommendation of UNESCO. And uh, I would say that in this uh, technological um, context, uh, all the gaps that we see for gender around the world in labor, in representation, in decision making, in uh, all the issues and incentives for women to be in certain disciplines and not in others are, are compounded. And, and they're scary because the fact is that uh, these technologies are not just helping us advance certain areas of our economy, they are building another economy. And therefore, if we are building another economy, uh, not having women well represented is a risk. So could you share with us very concrete elements of how you think uh, this aspect of um, inclusion can be, can be better tackled? Definitely. Um, firstly, and what I love about the recommendation and the instrument we, we built uh, together with the, with the input of thousands of, of people around the world, is that gender, that it was normally how it was treated in other documents or other ethical recommendations. Gender and, and you know, participation was under bias, was under discrimination. However, what I love about this instrument, it, it is that it has a special aspect to it and it has a section that talks about gender, not only in the code, and not only in the biases language, but also in the greater and more profound root causes that we have with uh, gender disparities in the sector. It is not easy to say that only 14% of researchers um, participate in the sector, but also um, we have to question what are the root causes are impeding uh, gender equality uh, in, in general. Um, for example, um, when we're talking about AI systems and widening the gaps, we're not talking about only um, certain aspects, but we're talking about all human rights. For example, we're talking about biases um, in the hiring of the workforce that translates into our economic opportunities for women, but also we're seeing about if or they cannot have access to credits, for example. But then talking about broader and which I love about the recommendation is that goes beyond and touches other points. For example, how can we talk about effective women participation if we're not talking about the culture of institutions and the sexism, for example, or what policies are in, are in place for practical um, institutions to be able to retain talent and retain women in the workforce? How can we talk about uh, equal access to opportunities in women in the workforce, especially in, the, in this digital economy, if we're not addressing the fact that we need maternity and paternity leave in institutions to address this participation? How can we talk about it if we're not addressing the fact that social, there's a social network that has to be set in place for women and families to be able to leave their babies in a, in a secure place to be able to work in the first place. So when we talk about this, uh, this aspect, um, one is how can we have a specific focus and action plan that has specific actions for gender and not gender being embedded in other a aspects of action plans, such as biases, such as in the AI life cycle. So it has to have a special focus in action plans. That is one of the recommendations this, uh, this ethical instrument sets. And also strengthening and highlighting the fact 
that we need more education tailored, program tailored for women. We need more economic incentives tailored for women. And especially, and I'll end with that because it's a very passionate topic we're, we're, we're working on with gender, but gender, we cannot have a discourse that is, oh, gender, as if it was one group that we're talking about. We have to talk about the diverse areas of gender. We have to talk about women with um, physical um, incapacities. We have to talk about women that are minorities. We have to talk about sexual preferences. We have to broaden the aspect when we talk about gender equality and female participation to able to touch about the various lenses there is because a narrow view to gender will also lead to narrow actions. And this recommendation, one of the underlying facts that it highlights is gender is not one thing. It is a virus and multiplicity of perspectives that have to be included in action plans. Indeed, I, I, I'm, I'm, always, I'm always thinking because I have been uh, spending quite a uh, part of my uh, career promoting inclusive growth. And many of the of the policies and rules and incentives that you just use for the world to increase female participation in the labor force or to increase female um, presence in the boards and includes it, it all comes to the same to level the playing field for women to do it. And as you say, then you need to go to the very specific issues um, to to ensure that that's the case. Um, we we really are, are uh, looking forward also to work with you. Um, Constanza on this on this question, uh, although it's uh, it's mind boggling if if the if the developers would only realize that eighty five percent of developments in the AI uh, world are done by male only teams, sometimes it just takes to recognize that in your team. It's as simple as that. We're not talking about regulation. We're not talking about top down approaches. We're just talking about getting into the you know, mindset of people that are in this business, uh, the fact that they need to have diversity at the table and at the teams and ensure that this is the case. Uh, I want to, to tell you that we have some questions here and, and I want to move to the, to the public because uh, this has been a fascinating conversation and I could spend three more hours with you, my dear friends, <laughs> because each one of you are, are putting things at the table that uh, brings some other issues. But there, were, there are some questions that I want to that I want to raise with you uh, because they are really linked to the to the um, to the issues we are discussing. Let me tell you. Uh, first of all, uh, of course, at the end, I would like all of you to tell me. This is a question from Daphna Feinkels that uh, maybe you, some of you know. I know. Uh, but she's the head of the bioethics uh, um, section here in UNESCO and she was uh, overseeing the question of the recommendation. I would like to ask you at the end to the three of you, the question of civil society. How do we ensure that we also engage uh, the voices of civil society on these issues? Uh, but then there was this question also by um, uh, Céline Dupont, who's asking us, um, do you think that when you talk about diversity, is it that you need to have a general purpose kind of <laughs> regulation? Or you think that you would need to have something on finance, something on health, and then you go into the detail? Uh, very fast, the three of you, and then let's move to the, to the civil society. So Maya, you, do we need to go into finances different from health, from education, from in terms of diversity? Of yeah, course, that, finance is a male's world. <laughs> sure, that, that's, that's a great question, actually. And then um, the, the, the preferred approach to um, technology policy is a cross-cut policy. And, and this is something that I learned uh, during my experience uh, in, in the technology sector. And, and the cross-cut policy is, uh, is similar to the AI ethics principles approach. So you set the very general principles so that others can, can, can adopt it in a way that suits their um, either nation legislation system or probably their sectors. So I, I would go for a general statement or a policy that suits the diversity principles and, and then it can be adopted in different sectors um, in, in a very special format. And, and that's my preferred approach, I would say. 
Thank you. Thank you, Zumaya. What about you, Alice? Um, I would say in terms of um, <clears throat> diversity of teams or things like that, um, probably healthcare or finance is not necessarily a unique area to regulate. But when we talk about diversity in terms of the need for greater fairness assessments or fairness checks or considerations about the training data, um, I think there are potentially arguments there that you might want some stronger regulations in high stakes domains where there might be especially concerns about bias. And, and you, Constanza? I, mean, I also, uh, a plus one on the transversal side and the policy perspective of this being a foundational aspect for any type of industry and any type of application. However, I do um, maybe emphasizing that um, on the diversity and the broad world of diversity, having tailored action plans for, for example, gender minorities, like going deeper into what to do with each time of profile, for example, what does access mean for the migrant populations? What does access mean with people with physical disabilities? I believe that where we can go vertical is in the how do we bring different groups and populations and different uh, cultures. And on the transversal side is yes, this diversity on that implies every aspect to it. I, I, would, I would actually, um... That was a very good question because the fact is that uh, it's it's very important to have the general framework, but when you think about, for example, health, no, the the health data that we are generating and and the health applications that AI is is developing that are just mind boggling in terms of the promise of of bringing solutions to so many ills uh, of our populations. But we have been confronted the fact that in the health sector, some of the solutions are really male designed. And sometimes the technologies are not uh, able to, to, to provide the very same outcomes when it's related to women or again, the, their, they perform less well. So it's quite, quite an interesting question. Let me then uh, get you into uh, probably, Constanza, we will do the other way around because it's not easy to, um, um, and because you are also uh, in, a, in, an, in an organization that is bringing the voices of uh, civil society in many ways, uh, doing very good uh, research, but also a very good um, advocacy. Um, it's very easy to say, bring the civil society, no? And we did it with the recommendation. We could not have done it without regional consultations, but for that, we spent two years in, in, in reaching out, in, in trying to bring representative uh, people and, 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 and getting to understand it's, and companies need to deliver and, and governments need to deliver and you need to deliver. And therefore, how do you ensure that, that you bring these voices and, and get their insights and the contributions that they can make? For us, it has been a lot of um, one open mindset. So we are definitely seeing a shift in mindset where transparency is a base of trust. We're not only seeing it in very specific applications, for example, um, algorithmic and explainability of algorithms, no, but we're seeing it more as a culture change where we're seeing that there's an explicit added value to have trusted ecosystems to move forward for the effectiveness and the sustainability of action. So this does not only imply within institutions with the development of um, certain governance frameworks or certain policies within an institution, but broadly speaking, we're talking about new governance frameworks. So for example, in Mexico, we're doing a, a lot of prototype uh, policy prototypes, understanding how can we regulate a field that is moving so fast and that has, as Alice said, some tensions all over. So having these new forms of experimental governance types where we're working as civil society that CMINES is taking that facilitator role, bringing together governance, um, regulators, companies, and startups, for example, and other experts in the civil society to tackle um, questions together. For example, in Mexico, what does it mean to regulate um, transparent and explainable AI? Well, these questions are quite complex and understanding the value that multidisciplinary and multi-sector teams bring to the equation is another form of diversity, which have a lot of proven cases in both the effectiveness, the appropriation, and also when we're talking about how to transform principles into action, there is no way that civil society cannot have a seat, like it has to have a seat at the table. If not, sustainability 
and profoundness of action is not possible. For us, it has been two um, factors. One, um, transparency in the processes and also rethinking the power structures behind these processes. We do know that there's a power component to this and making a very transparent participation and enabling more voices throughout the entire life cycle has been key to our efforts. We, we just learn from each other and that's, uh, that's just so enriching uh, in every step of the way. Uh, Alice, over to you and then we will have Sumaya for the last word in this panel, but not for our conversation that will continue. Alice. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, so I think it's incredibly important um, as we move forward to think very carefully about how we can engage um, with civil society and various stakeholder groups in this space. And I think part of what's very important there is to try also to avoid the risk of tokenization where certain folks are included in the conversation in order to sort of tick a box and say, yes, we consulted with the affected communities or vulnerable groups. And so now we've gotten that stamp of approval. And I think that's especially important because often what's very challenging with engaging with stakeholder groups around AI is to some extent, all of us are relevant stakeholders. Um, AI is so broad, um, it involves so many different communities. And so at the end of the day, any sort of subset of communities that you bring to the table are only going to be one very small portion of the overall group. And so I think it's quite important for folks when they are especially engaging on the civil society side to acknowledge that and recognize, okay, even if we say we're engaging with stakeholders or engaging with civil society, we're really more specifically engaging with these particular slices and Pragmatically, it'll always be that case. We'll never be able to engage with everyone, but that means that we need to also acknowledge and think about the blind spots that still persist. And um, as um, Constanza was talking about, I think thinking about the process, thinking about documenting that process is very important in order to ensure that these blind spots do get documented and down the line, if there are problems, those are revisited. Um, so from that perspective, I think I would just primarily caution that as much as important as it is to try to make sure every stakeholder group is represented, always remember that you're never actually going to be able to get everyone's perspectives and thinking that you have can make it seem that your process was more robust than it actually was. That is true, but just but just having in mind that, that, that this is important and that we cannot be in our corners, no? Thinking that we can uh, uh, do it by ourselves without uh, reaching out is also is also um, is also risky. We we know that has also become uh, risky. So Maya, your your final thoughts on this? Sure. As a civil uh, servant or a civil society, um, my role as a civil society to the civil society would be um, just to ensure the inclusiveness. Um, and the diversity through different approaches. One is, um, so mainly it's just to, to focus on the awareness and the education for the leaders. Uh, do they, do, do the executive actually uh, portray the inclusiveness and the diversity in their operation? Um, the other way as well is to honor the diversity of the team. I, I, I saw that the, one of the WEF economic forum initiatives related to the AI procurement uh, in the government and one of the principles that they have stated is to have a diverse team, diversity in terms of the gender, the background, the, the knowledge, and, and this will, it will ensure the inclusiveness as well um, after the post the, the, the development phase of the AI system. And, and then another way is in something that we are looking into right now in the UAE is the awarding approach. So we define some criteria of excellence. How, how do you define excellence in AI system? And, and based on that, you award those who were really um, uh, in compliance with the guidelines and the principles, which are not yet enforceable. And then there is the enforcement way, um, and that's um, uh, being or fighting anti-discriminatory um, um, behaviors. And, and this is something that we are currently enforcing in order to ensure the diversity and, and um, as a consequence, the inclusion as well. Well, well, I think that what, what Sumaya is reminding us is that the governments have the duty of care <laughs> and have the tools to ensure 
that uh, that the business model that uh, these technologies uh, uh, deploy uh, will be aligned to the outcomes that uh, that we all want. Uh, diversity might not be an outcome in itself, although for UNESCO it is, but it's the most um, um, effective tool that we have to ensure that uh, uh, the outcomes uh, of whatever we do, as I said, it could be the technological developments and the digital developments that we are uh, talking today, uh, but also it can be just in, in any school and any university, in the government, diversity in the government, even dealing with things that are not related to the technologies, are always a source of um, controls for risks not to be taken. And I feel that this conversation has been uh, enlightened. I, I could not uh, ask you any more the questions that I have in the chat. I have one more for, from uh, Mr. Payan, who is asking about peace, but I would say that, uh, that the whole thing that we are discussing now is how to keep a peaceful societies and how to control the downsides. Uh, I have to say that uh, when we started working for the recommendations on the ethics of artificial intelligence, of course, there were these looming dangers that we know in terms of the misuse or the abuse or the lack of, uh, of accountability or the lack of transparency that were, were, were worrying many people about the technologies, the lack of representativeness, the lack of trans all the things that we have been discussing today. But what you have uh, shown us, this very powerful group of uh, ladies, <laughs> uh, Sumaya, Alice, and, and, and Constanza, is that we have the means, we have the will, and we will do it. And I think that uh, what we take from the conversation with you from UNESCO is that we have champions all over uh, the world uh, in this multi-stakeholder approach, because uh, our peer audience will notice that we actually uh, bring the government, we, br we brought the uh, business and we brought uh, the civil uh, society perspective to really build a common uh, narrative. For me, it has been a pleasure and, um, and uh, having been approved with the recommendation on the ethics of AI of uh, UNESCO uh, just this month, uh, I think that we have a lot to build up from these uh, conversations and learning from individuals like you. So thank you so much. Uh, we come to the end of the panel uh, and really it has been a, a great, great uh, source of uh, knowledge and inspiration and we will continue the conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you, it's a pleasure. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank Bye. you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye.